Hello and good morning uh, and welcome to this week. Hey, Scott. Hey, Joe. How How good, good, morning, good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. You're right. You're right. We got all got to pay homage to the poet laureate of our people and country, at least at one stage. That was uh, Langston, the great Langston you. So good morning, Revolution, everyone. Um, what's going on in your neck of the woods? How are you? Uh, doing well, uh, getting cold here. Um, I'm kind of looking forward to snow. I want to, I want to get out skiing. Um, skiing, okay. Yeah, but uh, other than that, not a lot. How about you? In skiing, we used to sleigh ride when we were children, but that was a long time ago. A long time ago indeed. So, have you been watching the impeachment hearings? You know, not not as closely as I should. Uh, I've I've been kind of looking at the headlines, and apparently uh, the uh, the debate on you know prior to the voting was very long and, and very acrimonious. How about you? Yeah, I watched some of it. I was uh, struck yesterday because uh, the uh, chairman um, of the uh, one of the uh, committees, uh, Democratic. Um, made a very interesting point in relationship to Trump's refusal to in any way cooperate with the uh, impeachment. I mean, they won't turn over any documents. They won't allow any witnesses to show up, you know. They're not even claiming uh, executive privilege. And the gentleman made the point that this is, uh, that they have to address it by impeachment because for Trump not to address it is a, and for Trump to do this is a step toward dictatorship. Absolutely. Uh, and this step is, towards dictatorship. Hello. And, and for me, this is maybe the, the major question in, in this impeachment is, you know, his, the, the refusal of the entire regime to abide by even the most basic um, constitutional protections. Um, it really shows you know, the, the level of contempt that they have, not just for for our, our leftist notion of advanced progressive democracy, but for even the basic capitalist democracy that, you know, uh, we got maybe lulled into taking for granted for a long time. And a step towards dictatorship is a step towards fascism. You know, you can call it authoritarian and all you want, neo no, a liberal democracy is a favorite bourgeois term. I ain't got nothing to do with democracy. Yeah. Nothing to act like this, you know, is it's just so dangerous, which raises the stakes so much in this election. Um, have you been following the uh, Democratic uh, polls and the primaries? It seems like your homeboy, Mr. Biden, is still doing well, but also that uh, Sanders and Mrs. Warren is. Uh, they're holding their own. Mm -hmm. um, Kamala Harris dropped out. Yes, uh, dropped out. Corey and uh, Booker did not qualify for the next. Cory Booker didn't qualify for the uh, debate, uh, so he's not going to be on the stage. He's only polling at two percent. Oh, wow. and his mentor, his, his 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 campaign, which is kind of the theme of which is uh, centrist love, centrist love. I love you. From the <laughs> center, <laughs> I guess love is a wonderful thing, <laughs> no matter where it comes even, from. Even even for, it, even centrists deserve to be loved. But it's not uh, a little bit, I guess. But it's not <laughs> inspiring people. You know, it's not moving the electorate. And in order to defeat Trump, you need an inspired and moved director uh, electorate. You know, there's this young woman on uh, meet. Uh, uh, on the NBC, MSNBC uh, Morning Joe uh, program. And she keeps making the point, and she's absolutely right, that it's gonna take a mass movement to defeat Trump, you know? He's got a mass movement behind him, bringing 20, uh, 15, 20,000 people out to these rallies. And, and you're gonna have to motivate people like Obama motivated people in 2008. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, is, is uh, Mr. Biden, in your opinion, doing that? Uh, uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't think so. And I think there's a kind of dangerous 
tendency developing, you know, with every poll that shows him in the lead to kind of um, slip in. I think the, the, the worst trap right now is sort of taking for granted that he's going to be the nominee. Mm. Uh, I don't I don't think that's a but I, I was curious, um, you know, policy wise, um, my sense is that that Biden and Booker and Biden and Harris are not that different. They're not that distinct from one another. They're within the kind of broad, you know, liberal centrist kind of camp. Um, why are why did Harris and Booker struggle so much and, and Biden is performing so well? Well, I think, you know, this is one of the things that the pundits are saying, which I think is true, and that they are looking for, they being the people, and in the case of uh, Kamala Harris and Cory Booker, the African-American people in particular, not just them, but they're looking for uh, a candidate who they feel can beat Trump. Remember that Obama didn't get no play whatsoever until he won the Iowa caucuses. And then in a flash, everything changed. And, uh, and, and he suddenly you know, became the front runner. And, and, and so I think that uh, this issue of who is electable um, is a, an important one. And, and I think that you know, I don't hold too much to these polls right now because once the primaries start, you know, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. It's a very dynamic process that is subject to a lot of change. And, 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 and you see the entry of two other centrists, um, the billionaire from New York, who's governor um, from, huh? Whose campaign seems to be, I don't know if it's collapsing, it's not even getting off to a start, right? His own people are, are criticizing him. Who is that? Uh, there was something about, um, uh, his campaign staff had to sort of um, remind people involved in the campaign not to kind of use Bloomberg news as a way of pushing. You're talking about Bloomberg now. Bloomberg's candidacy, yeah. Not Deval Patrick. Oh, not Deval Patrick. No, I was talking about Bloomberg. Sorry. But I don't know if it's collapsing. They're putting a lot of money in it. They spent more money on advertising than all the Democratic candidates uh, combined so far. Uh, and I'm sure that he's got money to buy the best professionals in the business. So we'll see what uh, what uh, happens. But here's the point, you know, in my opinion, it's going to take unity of the broad left and the broad center and a movement in order to defeat Trump. Both things have to happen. Any campaign that is based on the political center only like you had with Clinton in 2016 and her running mate, the uh, former governor of Virginia, yeah. you know, is, or, a, or a candidacy just of the left by itself, the so-called left anyway. Most of them are not left enough for me, but that's all right. Uh, uh, not that I consider myself on the extremes. I think I'm a fairly reasonable, rational guy, but any, any, it has to be the unity of the broad left and the broad center in order to de defeat Trump. And one, that's one condition, and the other condition is a mass movement. Do you think that any of that was at play in that election disaster that happened in the UK yesterday with Mr. Corbyn? Uh, you know, I think certainly. Um, I think there was a, uh, if, you, if you look at where labor lost support, it, it lost its heartland. The, the area in central and northern England called the the Red Wall. Uh, the Red Wall. It was a so. It looks like um, the more support there was for uh, leave um, in the referendum in an area. That's Brexit. Yeah. Uh, leave the European Union. Yeah, leave the European Union. So basically, I guess um, what one of the things that that seemed to happen was that the the kind of centrist forces, the 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 centrist part of the Labour Party, the, um, the Liberal Democrats, the, the very hard um, remain anti-Brexit people were, were, were so convinced and were so they, they didn't recognize what a disaster in some ways, many ways, the European Union has been for working people. And they just discounted, you know, 
all Brexit sentiment as some right-wing kind of anti-immigrant, racist, whatever, when in fact there was a huge left sentiment for, for, for Brexit. Um, and I believe the Communist Party of Britain, our, our fraternal party, uh, supported what it called Lexit, which is a, a left exit from the European Union. A left right, exit. right, right. Well, these uh, democratic and economic issues are not going to go away in Europe. I just, they had those big protests in France uh, against Macron and the attempt to uh, cut back on the uh, pensions, uh, right. you know, last week and, and so on. It doesn't seem like I don't know if this is the case that there was kind of that kind of mass movement on the ground in the UK during the course of the election campaign, which was one of the reasons that we've been calling for a workers and people's impeachment, um, that you need people out on the streets in order to demonstrate support for what's taking place in Congress, you know? Um, yeah, we have to recognize ourselves the, the the people as the the movers of this thing this would not have happened if it was just you know uh, left to the leadership of the democratic party or the house of representatives this people pushed for this they've been demanding it for um years now so yeah we got to build on that that's right and and that's one of the reasons you know just following that logic that you know we've been arguing that in order for um, you know Trump uh, to be defeated, we're going to have to call for a working class imprint and movement on the elections. You know, it's not enough just to run to the left. You know, uh, you've got to build a movement from below uh, that 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 pushes. Uh, and if the trade unions and and if the mass democratic organizations, the women's movement, civil rights, Latino anti-immigrant LGBTQ movement gets in and pushes hard from below, it'll just move the entire society. You know what I'm trying to say? In Absolutely, yeah. Direction. And this is, this is sort of a, one of the really important points of, of Marxism, um, that, you know, political change is not, it doesn't come, it's not driven primarily by ideas. That's, that's an idealist conception. Um, political change is made by masses of people in motion. The ideas can help that along, can help build unity, can can become, what does Marx call it? Uh, but when, when ideas are taken hold of, you know, by the masses, but just getting out the most left platform possible, making the most left demands possible, even if it inspires people, it's not going to replace the work of building organizations, building unity, building a, a broad swell. Um, and the more the working class and its allies can do that, the stronger the position will be in after Trump is defeated when we can start fighting for. And that was the lesson behind the Sanders campaign in 2016, because those progressive ideas, those socialist ideas that he put forward, those democratic ideas, <clears throat> was matched by a mass movement, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it forced uh, the Democratic Party to adopt many of those planks, if not all of them, into the Democratic platform. And I think the same thing is going to happen uh, today, though it's also the case that Warren is drawing big crowds. So they're, they've been going after her like her, yeah. nobody's business. I mean, just so, well, and what, what, so, all. why is that, do you think? Why, I, um, why is it that Warren, who's in fact a little bit to the, well, yeah, I would say a little bit to the right of Sanders on, on a lot of things. Um, why is she getting more uh, more savaged in the, the kind of right-wing press, and even the mainstream press, than, than Sanders is? I think they're afraid of her. They're afraid of her. And there's also an, an element of misogyny, you know, in it. You know, by misogyny, it's kind of a big word. We mean women hating prejudice against women, you know, sexism is another yeah. way to call it. You know, I think that that has something to do with it as, as well. Um, so, uh, and, you, and you gotta reject it, you know, mm -hmm. and you gotta call it out for, for, for what it is. And I think they're also afraid of Medicare for all, the pharmaceutical co uh, corporations, you know, uh, the hospital corporations, the big health, health insurance corporations there, 
afraid of losing their monopoly on yeah. profits. And, and so they are just savaging, savaging, savaging her. And, 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 and we have to re reject it and fight for unity on the issues during the uh, primaries. And that's gonna have a big impact on what happens at the convention and in the whole uh, effort to defeat Trump. So um, we got to more than see what happens. We got to be in it to win it. You published an article um, uh, where you argued that um, you know we shouldn't be. When we talk about this broad unity. We shouldn't be afraid of the 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 competition between sort of left and centrist platforms and programs and ideas because. As you said, in that confrontation, um, you know that that's how we advance, right? That's how we. Uh... Yeah, that's a, that's an important point, and you know it's really not my point. Uh, the, uh, Angela Davis made that point at the Alliance Conference in, in Chicago, and uh, and she was making it in in relationship to the abolitionist movement uh, with respect to prisons, prison abolition. We want to get rid of. Uh, prisons. We want to get rid of the police. And she said, some people might think that that's a wild, crazy idea, she said. But the point is that when, when, when you're in a struggle, you know, you have to put forward ideas and other people will respond. And it is in the clash, the dialectical, I imagine that's what Angela is thinking, clash of ideas and platforms, the new uh, forms of unity and consciousness and, and ideas are formed, you know, new platforms emerge in the course of that debate, in the course of that give and take. So it's not necessarily wrong to put forward the idea. What, what, what could be wrong is to have an uncompromising, you know, my way or the highway attitude with respect to it. So it's gotta be some give and take, you know. Marx, I think in the critique of the Gotha program, or maybe it was somewhere else, made the point that, you know, he, he urged the working class movement. He said, make whatever uh, practical concessions you need to make in order to guarantee the success of the movement, but never ever make theoretical concessions. You know, yeah. it's an important point that is worthy of reflection on, you know. What's the difference between like a principled question and another question that, that you can you know move around and adjust on, and uh, having that kind of perspective I think is really really important. What else did we get up on the CPUSA.org website this week? I know we published uh, that discussion question. What was it again? Uh, so, um, what does working class leadership and democratic struggle look like and how can the communist party most effectively uh, contribute to building the, the leading role the political independence of the working class. What does working class leadership look like folks we're asking you all, all of us to think about it and, and, and comment here <clears throat> on our Facebook page and you can write to us uh, go to our website cpusa.org click on the, the uh, top articles and 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 join the discussion. Yeah, uh, I think we got what three articles in so far. Um, yeah, and a, co a couple more under review. We published um, an exchange between uh, a conversation with you and, and Rick Nagan on the right. question of the elections. Um, we've got a, a a couple more that we've received, but but haven't published yet, and we'll get up soon. I'm working on something. Uh, somebody wrote in. A question, what is the ultra right? Um, so I want to kind of address that within the context of working class leadership and, and the path to socialism. Um, so we're, uh, you know, we've got some interesting stuff coming forth and we want to hear from you. You can write to us at discussion at cpusa.org. Um, oh, before I forget, um, two things. Uh, I just received in the mail uh, Tony Pesanovsky's new book, Let Them Tremble. Um, it's a collection of four uh, biographies of leaders of the Communist Party that aims to um, show the history of the party and the contributions the party has made um, in the post-McCarthy period, you know, since 1956, um, which is a, which a lot of people don't know as well as the, 
you know, the 30s and, and the, then the period of repression in the 50s. So you can order this from international publishers um, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. Uh, also, this weekend, um, Sunday night, 8 p.m., we are having a discussion of the reports to the National Committee. It's online. Um, there's a registration link up on our Facebook page. Um, we'll put it up again. Um, and the subjects will be impeachment, uh, the collective style of work, um, and of course, working class leadership and how we build it. It's really, really, really important conversation is going to play, take place on, on, on Sunday. So we encourage everybody to uh, join it and, and share your views. You know, one of the things, and I think we'll have to end on this point, is that we're doing more than just fighting against Trump. You know, struggle for democracy is more than just a fight against Trump, even though that is the principal form of it at this particular stage. We want to go beyond it. You know, we want to go beyond fighting voter suppression. We want uh, the restoration of the Civil Rights Act. But we want more than that even, you know, we want equality. We want uh, advanced radical revolutionary changes in this country on behalf of and in defense of the people. Uh, but in order to do that, you got to break the uh, lock that the GOP has had on the presidency, on the Supreme Court, still on the Senate and up until recently the House of Representatives. And that's going to take a lot of work. I think that that's going to do it. For this week, Scott. Yep. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Happy holidays, everyone. You know, holiday season is coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. Hanukkah and summer and, and the solstice and and uh, Christmas and Kwanzaa and whatever you celebrate. The New Year is coming, and it's going to be a great one. So we want to wish everybody a happy holiday. I think we'll have one more program next week before the holiday. Uh, so uh, we'll be seeing you in a week. Um, so take care and uh, keep your keep your head to the sky. Uh, and your hand on the plow. And your <laughs> and your feet on the ground. <laughs> take care. See you later. All right. Bye bye now.